I appreciate uh, Pastor Bragg, your pastor. He's such a gracious man. And uh, I know two years ago, I called him, and uh, we had a good missionary friend who actually died on the mission field. I don't know if you're familiar with Brother Stephen Trell. He died as a modern-day martyr, in my opinion, but uh, he was killed over uh, in the Middle East. And uh, so I called uh, Pastor Bragg, and I said, we're going to be coming through your area. Uh, do you have a missions apartment we could stay at? And he said, unfortunately, we don't uh, have that set up right now. We don't have anything like that. He said, but we'll put you up in a hotel. I said, no, that's not why I'm calling. I could not talk him out of it. He put us up in a super nice place, and I just I, I was blown away, and just, just a blessing to us. And I didn't even have a meeting or anything. He was just so kind and gracious. And I'll tell you, having been a pastor, um, you don't really know uh, what it's like to be a pastor until you are one. And I, I can tell you this, you need to pray for your pastor, pray for his wife, pray for his family. Um, the devil will target the pastor. If he can take down the leader, he can hurt a bunch of followers. So just pray for your pastor. And I know you do, but uh, he is a special man. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, not everybody can just take um, the church that they grew up in or are familiar with and, and uh, succeed. And, uh, and, and, and this, this church has a great spirit. We were able to come, uh, I guess it was uh, a couple times. Uh, and uh, every time I've been here, um, there's a great spirit in this church, and uh, the church will become like the pastor. And so it's a great testimony to him and to your Lord and Savior. So uh, if you have your Bible, Psalms chapter 81 tonight, Psalms chapter 81, I appreciate uh, Brother Parker. I remember him as a little kid. He looks more and more like his dad every day. I know he hates hearing that, but he, he just looks just like his dad. But I saw his dad here a couple weeks we were, uh, ago. We were in Louisiana but uh, Brother Parker took us out to a uh, restaurant and uh, fed us some delicious Mexican food. And I tried to limit what I ate, and that's my favorite food. So I said, I'm preaching tonight, so I'm going to get a to-go box and try to be careful on that. But a wonderful food. Uh, music's been wonderful. I'll tell you what, I don't know about you, but I love the old-fashioned hymns. I, it, you say, well, we sang that song tonight, no, nobody knew. Yeah, but it was doctrinally right. The music was right. I still was blessed by that. Amen. And he did get me. I, he said, my hand went up. He said, how many? My hand was the first one, so he got me on that one. But uh, <laughs> what a blessing to be in a church of like faith and practice. I graduated from OBC. Uh, I was in the same class as uh, Jana at the time, and uh, she was always a blessing. The thing I remember about Jana, she was always singing. And she didn't care who was around. She'd sing in the OBC hall. She'd be walking down the hall. I, I would hear her singing before I'd turn the car. I said, here comes Jana. And she's just singing down the hall. But the, the Bragg family has uh, been a, a huge blessing uh, to me through the years, just their testimony and their faithfulness. And as I said, you have a special pastor, so pray for him. Uh, they're at football camp and uh, as he's out there. Psalm chapter 81, we're going to read verses 13 uh, through verse number 16, and this is not a psalm of David, it's actually a psalm of Asaph, and I believe in this psalm we see uh, God's desire revealed, his, his dreams really for his people, if they would have only submitted themselves. If you take uh, notes tonight, I've entitled this, Fulfilling God's Dreams for You. Fulfilling God's Dreams for You. We'll read Psalms uh, 81, but uh, right before we do, Psalms 139 tells us in verses 17 and 18, you don't have to turn there, but David said, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. In other words, God thinks about us all the time. In fact, he said, If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Don't tell me God doesn't care about you. Don't tell me God doesn't think about you. God is in love with you, and God thinks about you so much that if you were to count his thoughts, you couldn't count them. That's not just cliche. That's what the Bible says. God thinks about you all day long. He thinks about us all the time. And I really believe God dreams for us. I believe God sees our life. He sees where you're at tonight, young person. He sees where you're at, middle-aged person. He sees where you're at, you're at uh, older person, a senior saint. Listen, he sees us, and he has a blueprint for your life. And he has dreams. I don't want to get to heaven one day and hear, hear God say, listen, 
Uh, here's what I could have done for you, John Magus. Here's what I had planned if only you would have submitted. I don't want to miss out on God's dreams for me. And uh, let's look at Psalms 81 now, verses 13 through 16. He says, and this is more of a lamentation, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. This is a statement, a lamentation. He's saying, this is what I wished Israel would have done, my people, if they'd have hearkened and if they had walked. Listen, that's just as relevant today as it was the time it was penned. God looks at his people today and says, man, I wish you'd listen to me. I wish you'd hearken. I wish you'd do what I said. How many times as parents we look at our children as they struggle and maybe they're having a time of disobedience or rebellion. By the way, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction driveth it far from him. That's what the Bible says. Foolishness is in there. We got to get it out. And uh, there's nothing you have to do to teach a child to be foolish. It's already there. The sin nature created that, uh, that foolishness bound. But listen, God looks at his people and he said, listen, I wish you would have just listened. And then he says, this is what I would have done for Israel. And this is fascinating to me. Verse 14, he says, I should soon have subdued their enemies. Don't miss that word soon. He wouldn't have prolonged. He wouldn't have waited. He said, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock should, have I, should I have satisfied thee. So what is, what is it that God dreams about doing for us? Well, we just read uh, several things. There's four things here that we see. Number one, that God could subdue our enemies. All of us have adversaries or opponents or enemies in the Christian life. You know, you don't have to put a cross symbol on your, your car or wear a fish sticker uh, to, to get some, some, some kind of um, attack from the world today. All you have to do is stand for something wholesome. Just stand for marriage. Just, just say, hey, marriage is between a man and a woman. And there's a crowd today that doesn't like that. Just say, well, there's just two genders because God said that, that he created male and female. That's all you have to say to just stand for something good and wholesome and you will be ridiculed today. But listen, we will have enemies in the Christian life, but if we'll surrender to God and we'll submit ourselves to him, God will take care of the enemies. And listen, enemy, enemy number one is the devil. You say, I don't have any enemies. Well, if you're saved very long, you will have many enemies. And uh, there'll be spiritual enemies. They may be in your own family, in your own neighborhood, in your own uh, uh, workplace. Uh, but, but understand there's a principle in God's word. If we'll surrender, if we'll just do what he says, he's, God said, I would soon have subdued their enemy. One thing about Israel that you notice is Israel's constantly fighting an enemy, aren't they? I mean, it was the Philistines, it was the... The Hittites, the Perizzites, all of the termites, it was all of it. You understand, uh, that's in the Greek somewhere, you've got to dig to find that. But no, understand there were enemies constantly, but God can subdue enemies if we'll just surrender to him. So when we began planting the Lansing Baptist Church, there was a, a fella in the neighborhood, he's, he's uh, I believe, he's, is he 83, honey? Am I getting that right? He's 83, I've been driving, I'm a little tired but I'm thankful for my wife. Uh, uh, pray for me. I, sh I hope she forgave me. I, uh, I did a boo-boo this morning. We've been married 17, 17 years. That's right. 17 years. Anyway, uh, my wife loves uh, these frou-frou drinks, I call them. But she likes Starbucks. She likes uh, the, those style of drinks. And they had a Walnut Street Cafe. And uh, if I feel, if I sound a little tired tonight, we just moved. I mean, we literally just moved to Lawrence the last several days. So uh, we, we have really been going and blowing. But uh, this morning she stopped by the cafe and she got herself a, some kind of a mocha, a Walnut Street mocha. It's their specialty. She made the statement. She said, they have the best hot drink that I've ever had out of anybody. It's my favorite one. And uh, so anyway, I didn't know she had stopped and got the drink. So we're, we're preparing uh, uh, to uh, make one last trip to storage, put our things in storage, and then get on the road to come to St. Louis. So anyway, I'm cleaning off everything, and when I'm in cleaning mode, man, I'm in cleaning mode. 
And uh, I saw this cup sitting up on the counter with my stuff, and I thought, man, somebody left a drink and wasted a drink the other day when we were here working. And I just grabbed it, and I had work gloves on. Had I not had work gloves on, I would have felt that the cup was still hot. I thought it was old and had been left behind, so I took the cup with my work gloves, dumped it down the sink, threw it in the trash, and I've been in the doghouse ever since, so pray for me tonight. But uh, anyway, I do hope she forgives me. I I thank God for my wife. But uh, back to the story. Charlie is 83 years old. Charlie lives in the neighborhood of the Lansing Baptist Church plant, and uh, Charlie initially said, I don't want a church coming into this neighborhood. He said, I want a community center. I want this, I want that, I don't want a church. He was, he's kind of persnickety, if I can use that word. And uh, he, he just didn't want a church coming. But a year later, we just celebrated our year anniversary, Charlie has become an advocate for the church. Charlie will call me, he, he calls me John, he's like, hey, he knows I'm the pastor over Hey John, he's like, he's always giving me the, the neighborhood gossip. And whether I want to hear it or not, and he said, I've been here 83 years, or I've been here for 40-some years. He's 83, and he's been in that neighborhood over 40 years. He knows, I know, I know the gossip several blocks in that area. So anyway, <laughs> um, whether I like it or not, he'll tell me. So, uh, but what I'm saying is God did that in his heart. Charlie was dead set against the church, and we've just been kind, and we've just been faithful, and he's seen that we're not a menace we are not, we're not doing anything but helping the community. And Charlie's our best friend. Pray for Charlie. I don't know that he's saved. And it, every time I bring up spiritual things, he just shuts down. But man, he is getting friends. He walks every week and he tells me, hey, preacher, he said, I'll, I'll walk in your parking lot and keep an eye on the place every week. He said, I always walk around your property. And he has become our friend. What I'm saying is God did that. I didn't do that. God did that. Listen, if you just surrender to God's will... He can subdue your enemies. Second of all, God-haters would even submit to him. This is very interesting. Look at verse 15. Verse number 15. He said, The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. The haters of the Lord. You know, there are people that hate God today. They hate the Lord. Isn't it amazing that the blasphemous things that we see in this world today are not directed at Muhammad? They're not directed at Confucius. They're not directed at any uh, Buddha or anyone else. They're always directed at Jesus Christ, aren't they? Always. There is a spirit of Antichrist. There was in the Apostles' day. There is today. We shouldn't be surprised at that. But there's a lot of hatred and vitriol against the very person of Jesus Christ today. This world is Antichrist. It shouldn't shock us. It shouldn't surprise us. But I, I, I believe that the reason much of the unbelieving world does not submit to God is because many in the believing world have quit submitting to God. You understand, God said, you submit to me, and even the God-haters will submit themselves to me. You know, I thought about Moses as he stood in a godless country called Egypt, A godless country who the leader, Pharaoh, said, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. And I think he was genuine. I think he really had never seen God like others had seen God. And he said, I don't know who the Lord is. And the Bible tells us there are people that are willingly ignorant of the truth. He didn't want to know. And uh, yet Moses surrendered to lead God's people. Moses surrendered to do what God had called him to do. And you you understand that the Egyptians began to acknowledge God. These God-haters themselves began to acknowledge even... Remember with the plague of lice, it's one of my favorite statements in the Old Testament. The uh, magicians came to Pharaoh and they said, Don't you realize this is the finger of God? There it was. They could not compete with God's finger. You say, which finger was it? I believe it was his pinky. Amen? It was his pinky. And uh, he defeated that entire godless, heathenistic nation. Why is that? Because God can subdue the God-haters. God can subdue our enemies. It's our job to surrender. It's our job to surrender. Number three, God's people would be established. Look at the statement at the end of verse 15. He says, the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time, talking about my people, his people, Their time should have endured forever. 
God would have firmly established this relationship with his people. You know, God wants and desires to walk with us and to spend time with us. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You understand every step you take towards God, he takes a step towards you. Every step. And one of these days, we're going to be together forever, but we don't need to wait till heaven. Right now, we need to be drawing close to God. God desires fellowship. You know, I always think back to original purpose. Why were we created? We were created for his pleasure, for his glory. God desires for us to walk. Listen, every time we pray, it makes God's day. Every time we seek his face, you realize we, that brings a smile to God's face? We can brighten his day, if you would. If we would just talk to him and walk with it, that's what he desires. God said, listen, I wish our time could just last forever. That's the, you understand who God is? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Alpha and Omega. He's kind of like a, a good sandwich, amen? I don't know about you. I know McDonald's gets a lot of bad rap these days. We got all these vegans and all these, these weirdos. But anyway, uh, people don't want to go to McDonald's anymore. I grew up uh, with McDonald's, and the thing about McDonald's is still tastes the exact same. I mean, a double cheeseburger today tastes exactly like it did in the 80s when I was a kid. At least in my head it does. But I've always liked the Big Mac. Big Mac starts with the bun. You've got the sesame seeds. I mean, I like, I like the bun on a Big Mac, and I like everything in between. He's Alpha and Omega, and he's everything in between. He's A, he's Z, and he's all of it. And you understand, that's who our God is. And he wants to, to establish a relationship with us forever. And God had special plans for Israel. In fact, he told Moses, he said, I want to make Israel a kingdom of priests. I want the whole nation to be a holy nation in Exodus 19.6. You know, God desires for us to be holy. You think about this. God is holy. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. God is holy. That's who he is. He cannot stop being who he is. He is a holy God. So why should we strive to be holy so we can, we can have fellowship with God? You know, the Bible tells us that his church is to be holy. His church. Look over to Ephesians chapter 5 very quickly, if you would. Ephesians chapter 5. You know, do, do we really understand what holiness is in a very unholy world? We live in an unholy world. You say, I don't believe that. Just turn on the TV for a couple seconds. We live in an unholy world. And yet, God's people are to be holy. We serve a thrice holy God. We, we have a holy Bible when you're saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And listen, the holiness is not a spirit of this world. The world has a spirit, and it's an unholy spirit. But I'm telling you, everything about God is holy. And the more you immerse in his word, the more holy you will become. The more you bask in the S-O-N, the sun, the more you will be holy like him. And the Bible tells us about the church in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, I have a wonderful wife, but she's imperfect. And the truth is, Jesus loves an imperfect church. And I'm thankful for it. We don't deserve his love tonight, folks. We do not. I do not. I know, I know who I am. And I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. But Christ loved the church. And husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And it tells us that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, I know your pastor preaches this book. And that will keep a church right. That will keep a church holy. You know, Bible preaching is becoming a thing of the past. And we need to get back to the book. We've got to get back to preaching the word of God. And God will use his word to cleanse us. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to his word. Understand, God's word cleanses the church. It keeps it clean. And it says in verse 27 that he might present it, talking about the church, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
God is preparing the church for the coming uh, great wedding ceremony that's going to take uh, place when Christ comes to get the bride. And it's coming. You say, when's the trumpet going to sound, preacher? I don't know when, but I'll tell you this much. We're one Wednesday night closer than we were last week. <laughs> we're one week closer. We're one month closer. We're one year closer. Jesus is coming. The trumpet is going to sound. God's people need to be ready as God cleanses us and washes us and sanctifies us. He's getting ready to present the church. And we need to be in our position, striving to be holy, striving to be sanctified, striving to be cleansed, and allowing him to do that work. God's people would be established. Fourthly, I see God's dream for Israel is that he would have given them the very best. Look at verse 16. This is really a message of surrender. Because it all hinged on Israel surrendering and listening to what God had to submit their will to his. To take his plans in their life. You see, God has a blueprint for your life tonight. He knows exactly what he has for you. I made this statement before church. I was talking to Brother Parker. Brother Parker's a fine man. And I appreciate him. He's been a servant ever since I've known him. Brother Kyle's always been a servant. He's still a servant. And I appreciate that. And God will use him if he just continues to be a servant. But I told him the best place to find the will of God is to do the will of God. The best place to discover specifics about the will of God is just do what you know to do. Go to church. Continue to pray. Read your Bible. Go soul winning. Tithe. Be faithful. Just do what you know you're supposed to do. And if God wants something more specific, he'll tell you. Believe me, he'll tell you. And uh, uh, you, can't, you cannot outrun God. Just look at Jonah. You can't run from God. God will show you exactly what he has for you if you'll just be faithful in his will. Listen, verse 16, it says, He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock. Should I have satisfied thee? You know, when I first read these words, I went back over them and I, I thought about that. These are things Israel never got. They missed out on. These are things that God said, I would have done for you, but I wasn't able to. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat. They may have had blessings, but they didn't have the finest. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You see, God wants you to have the finest of blessings. Not just, and when we think blessings, don't just think monetary the truth is he may give you a sweet peace in your home, a, a, a blessed peace that money cannot buy. You know how many homes are in turmoil today because of wickedness? Turmoil. I mean, marriages are falling apart, divorces on the rise. Why is that? Because money doesn't buy peace. Money cannot buy happiness. It can buy some temp temporary happiness, but it cannot, uh, uh, it cannot purchase abiding joy that will last through the storms of life. I'm talking about a joy in the midst of sorrow. How you can go through deep troubles and deep waters and yet God can be your stay and to learn that, listen, we have a God who will, uh, he promised that he would go with us in the fire. He never said, hey, you won't go through the fire or you won't have trials or you won't have hardships, but he did say, I'll go with you in the fire. I'll go with you in the trials. I'll be with you in that valley. I'll be with you in that storm. God wants you to have the finest of blessings. If you'll just surrender your life, God will give you the finest of blessings. He will bless your life. Listen, God wants you to have the finest of the wheat. He doesn't want you just to live on leftovers. He wants the finest for you. God wants you to have honey from the rock. He wants you to have honey from the rock. You know, I read about the water that came from a rock, and that's pretty miraculous. I read about the quail. God sent manna from heaven. All the miracles that we, we read about. And uh, listen, it's history. It happened. It was reality. Israel woke up to manna. All around, God was providing angels' food to man, and God uh, allowed the water to come from the rock. And listen, you say, well, that's not a big deal. Have you ever seen water come from a rock? I mean, God was doing amazing things, but here's the mention of honey from the rock. Can you imagine honey from a rock? I don't know everything about it, but it sure sounds good to me. He said, Israel, I had honey from the rock for you. So when I began to branch out and uh, 
I began to raise support and trust God to go full time with the church. Back in April, I lost my job, and uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but that was just God's way of kicking me out of the nest. I'm the kind of guy I like routine. <laughs> We've moved three times in the last three years, my wife told me. And uh, if you knew me, you know that's not, that's not my doing, all right? That has to be God, and he's just kicked me out of the nest and propelled me forward. But I'm on what you'd call a faith journey. You no know, faith, as a pastor, I've, I've been preaching for years, and faith's real easy to preach about, but it's harder to live. It's one thing to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to live by faith. It's another thing to do it, and, uh, but it's, it's the only way. I'll tell you, there's only one direction in the Christian life, and that's forward. Not neutral, not in reverse, but forward, living by faith. And listen, so I lost my job in April, and I thought, boy, how are we going to make it? I only have a limited amount of support right now. The church can only do so much as we're, we're, uh, we're uh, growing and um, we're seeing lots of visitors. By the way, we've seen almost 10 people saved recently. It's been exciting out on soul winning. Don't tell me soul winning doesn't work. People that say, oh, soul winning doesn't work, you don't work soul winning. Listen, there are people hungry for the gospel. Most of these folks were under the age of 20 that got saved. And uh, it was an amazing thing just to see all these people saved from soul winning. But... Um, Anyway, I began to pray, Lord, you're going to have to provide for us. And uh, so I don't know who mentioned it first. I think my wife said, honey, you ought to try to sell the rock. Sell the rock. We had a, a big rock on our property. And uh, it was just a big boulder. It was a pink granite that came from Nebraska. And so I have a picture on my phone with all five of my kids. This thing was nine, or six feet tall, nine feet wide probably about four, four feet uh, thick. This thing was a massive boulder. They told me it was original break-off from another huge rock in Nebraska. Anyway, she said, sell the rock. So you say, what'd you do? I went on Facebook Marketplace. Why not? You might as well try. So I posted the rock on Facebook Marketplace. And uh, I've heard the term cyber bullied before. And I, and I, I felt the sting for the first time. I was cyber bullied. Anyway, I got all this hate, hate mail back. They're like, oh, you're trying to sell your pet rock? Is this a joke? Is this for real? I mean, people just bashing on me. But about the third day, this guy was serious, and he came through. He said, hey, how much for the rock? I want that rock. He said, I collect those. And uh, I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, I'll give you $2,500. $2,500 for a rock. I was like, this for real? Well, I didn't get back to him right away. And so I checked my phone uh, a couple hours later, and he said 3500 I thought, man, I'm going to keep holding that. No, 3500 And he said, and I'll pay to haul it. And he said, I don't know what possessed me. He said, I haven't paid more uh, for a rock since my wife's uh, rock when we got married. So I'm holding in my hand a break off from that rock. Just as I've, this has been all over the country. This has been down in Louisiana. It's been through Texas, Mississippi, been through Tennessee. It's been all over. And uh, it's just a reminder to me, God gave us some honey out of the rock right when we needed it. I mean, we sold that rock. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, and of course, my wife being the spiritual one, she's like, this isn't the first time that God has provided from a rock. I'm like, oh, okay. Super, I'm going to preach that. That's a great illustration. So anyway, so God did provide $3,500. While he was there, we had another smaller rock on the property, and he gave me uh, more money for that, uh, like 350 bucks. Anyway, I walked away from that about $4,000 richer from a rock. Listen, God can provide from anything. And I said, okay, Lord. So about a week later, I was able to pay the bills. I thought, man, God's, God's doing some neat things. And I'm coming back from soul winning, of all things, and I topped a hill and a deer was crossing the road. It was one of those things. I wasn't speeding, but there was nothing I could do. I could have been going 40 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. This thing would have still hit me. It's like he stopped and, and hesitated. Do I go back? Do I go? No, I'm going to go right to the van. I mean, just right into the passenger side. Nobody got hurt, but my insurance company totaled out the van. It was mostly cosmetic. It, it kind of smashed the radiator, the condenser. It smashed the headlight. I mean, I had all kinds of body damage. But they totaled out the van, so I was able to get a check to get repairs and have $1,000 left over. And I thought to myself, God sold the rock. God allowed this deer to come, and he's just providing in unusual way. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. 
I'm just telling you, if you surrender to God, I see all these young people and what great potential. Listen, you have the rest of your life in front of you. One thing I can say, I'm 41 now, and that's hard to believe. It wasn't, it wasn't but yesterday I was right where you were. I was sitting in church. I was a young person thinking, I got the rest of my life. Listen, I'm telling you, you don't believe me now, but I'm telling you, you're going to blink and you're going to be 40. I mean, time just, and you know what they tell me? The older you are, the faster it goes. And this thing of life, listen, surrender now. Just surrender. If I could give you any advice, if the only thing you remember from Brother Magus, remember this, surrender to God with your life. Surrender. And listen, he will give you some honey from a rock from honey from a rock. With heads bowed and eyes closed, and I'm done, let's stand to our feet. We'll have an invitation time. If God spoke to your heart and you have a need tonight, maybe it's the area of surrender. Maybe you're out there tonight and you say, I want some honey from a rock. Uh, I, I want God to fulfill some dreams in my life. And listen, God can do it for me. He can do it for anybody. He can do it for you. I don't know what the uh, need is. I can't see hearts tonight, but God sees your heart. Maybe there's just one young person that needs to surrender. Maybe there's just one adult. Maybe there's just one person tonight that needs to come forward and claim some honey from a rock. Maybe you need to surrender. Whatever the need is, with heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm going to pray. After I pray, the music will begin the invitation time. You come down to an old-fashioned altar and do business with God, whatever the need is. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Psalms 81. Thank you for Asaph's psalm. The challenge tonight to just surrender, to hearken, to walk in your ways so that you can do some special things in our life. Lord, you can give us honey from a rock. Lord, you can bring us the finest of wheat. You can subdue our enemies. Lord, you can even see the God-haters submit themselves. You can establish us. You can do all those things if we'll just surrender ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we come anew and afresh, yielded to Thee. Whatever the need is tonight, I pray you draw us closer to You. In Jesus' name, amen. As the music